the, the chair at Moorhead. Um, Russ did a postdoc at the Field Museum in Chicago, and then he took a faculty position at University of Louisiana Monroe, which is where I met him. Um, I was interested in working on turtles and the project didn't work out. And um, Russ basically said, I have money and a project. And I said, you have money and a project, I'll do it. Um, and uh, it basically changed the, the trajectory of my career, um, getting into freshwater invertebrates and molecular ecology for better or worse, uh, I think for the better. Um, and uh, yeah, and so um, since then he's, uh, had a couple of positions and he's now the department chair at Gannon University in Lake Erie. Um, his background is mainly has historically been in molecular systematics of, of mostly freshwater invertebrates, mostly freshwater snails. Um, but in the last, uh, you know, 10 years, I guess, close to 10 years, I mean, not quite has, has branched into a lot of 16 S microbial communities in, um, really diverse environments. Um, and he struck up a lot of collaborations um, with a variety of different projects. And today we're gonna hear about one of these um, sort of unique microbial communities that, that people often don't think about. So without further ado, I'll let you take it away, Russ. All right, thank you, Dave, Dr. Hayes. Um, okay, I can't share my screen. So someone needs to turn that on, please. You're good now, Russ. Okay. Aha, there we go. Can, are we good? Okay. Um, thank you everyone. Thanks for the invite. Um, taking time out of your Friday is always, a, can be a challenge. So yeah, so as Dave said, um, I'm gonna be talking about diversity and um, some functional differences of gut microbes from two different species of uh, freshwater viviparid snail. They're shown here. Um, before I start, though, as, as Dave's first graduate advisor, he was also my first graduate student, it wouldn't be fair to not have an embarrassing picture in the talk. Um, which, there we go. Um, uh, here are Dave and D Dr. Hayes, excuse me, and some of his um, floor mates. Um, it was, we had a, a bunch of good graduate students down at ULM. Um, some of some of his floor mates again doing a number of um, good things in their professions now, um, and then um, Jeff, which is more of an inside joke for Dr. Hayes. So it's disappeared. That's all. And. Uh... Uh, yeah. I w will also note, um, Dr. Harrell is also a, an alumni of uh, ULM as well. Yes, she is. One of Dr. Douglas's students, if I remember correctly. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, back to what we're actually going to be talking about, um, which are gut microbes. Now, I am not a microbiologist. Let's put that out there um, to start. Like Dave said, I'm... Um, I'm a classically trained molecular biologist. I moved into molecular systematics and molecular ecology um, for my PhD. And really over the last five years or so, I've kind of moved away from the systematics and have been looking more at um, kind of microbial interactions in the same freshwater snail taxa that I would traditionally study. So we know that gut microbes are important in a variety of different organisms. Um, we hear a lot about our gut microbiome and there's a huge pharmaceutical and over-the-counter industry on such. Um, if you were a snail like this little one here, your gut microbes would be very important for um, two main things. Um, the breakdown of structural carbohydrates Many snails um, are grazers, scrapers. They're eating a lot of plant material, whether dead or alive. And then um, nitrogen and organic precursor production that the snail can't produce by itself. All right? So we know that these microbial communities are important um, in the gut. And we also know that gut microbiomes are dynamic and that's at all different scales. So we know that different species of 
snail can have different gut microbiomes. We know that there may be a, re, um, a connection to reproductive mode. So um, in the invasive um, patamapyrgus shown here, sexual and asexual um, individuals have distinct microbiomes, both in their gut and in other compartments. Um, a lot of work has been done on the giant African land snail, which is the one shown at the bottom here, where again, you get different microbiomes in different digestive compartments, in different anatomical compartments. You get dietary changes um, can affect the microbiome. Um, estivation, which you can kind of think of as land snail hibernation. Um, estivating and non-estivating snails have very different gut microbiomes. So a lot of different environmental factors play into which bacteria are present and um, what those bacteria are doing. Now, apologies, I have a cold. Um, <clears throat> I'm also interested in invasive species and there's a number of freshwater invasive mollusks. Um, some of them shown here, uh, zebra mussels, Asian clams, um, faucet snails, apple snails, um, and so on. So the original purpose of this study was to see or to try to start gaining insight as to can the gut microbiome influence how invasive or how successfully invasive um, a freshwater snail can be. So if we know there's a lot of factors driving the microbiome, can those factors be exploited by the organism to become a good invader, a better invader? So we wanted to start um, by describing and comparing um, the microbiomes of co-occurring native and invasive species pairs. Okay. So this is far, this started out being far less hypothesis driven than it was descriptive. So we, we kind of need to know what the gut microbiomes of these snails look like, what they may be doing, and then we can start asking questions about, you know, kind of larger scale ecological and evolutionary questions. So um, we started with um, two species of live bearing snails in the family Viviparidae. Um, as the name implies, they are live bearing. Um, the females have a brood pouch that the juveniles develop in. And then as they develop, they are moved down the pouch and out the gonopore where they crawl out of the mother um, as whole functioning juveniles. The two species we used, um, so A here is um, Campyloma decisum. It is one of the most common viviparids across Eastern um, United States. Um, kind of an interesting snail, but again, you can pretty much find it anywhere that there's flowing water and sometimes even not flowing. Um, and that's our native. And then the invasive species was Heterogen japonica. Um, those of you who know freshwater inverts may have um, seen both Japanese and Chinese mystery snails. Um, they, the Japanese one used to be in the genus Cypangopelodyna, but has recently moved to Heterogen. Um, they're easily distinguished in the field as adults, so no problems there. And then shells shown, and then some um, microscope images of heterogen juveniles um, taken straight out of the brood pouch um, so that you can kind of see what they look like. Um, some examples, again, of just where you would find them. Any um, small to large flowing river, um, this would be a very common place you would find them. Uh, both species, in fact, um, you can find them together. They are syntopic and um, or even just sort of in backwater areas like this. Um, very oftentimes they're going to be sitting on top of the substrate. They'll be uh, might be slightly buried in the mud. They are grazers. Both can filter feed as well. 
um, just sort of a, a good all-purpose freshwater snail. So again, we were trying to compare the native to the invasive species. So we established three hypotheses um, that we did end up wanting to test. Again, we used the null hypotheses that there are no differences um, in the microbiomes of the gut microbiomes of both species. They have similar um, ecological niches. They have similar dietary habits. Um, they're similar behaviorally. You find them together. They're you know they're at least related to one another. So we started out just saying that there was going to be no differences between them. So um, alpha diversity and beta diversity for the microbiomes would be the same in both species. By alpha diversity here, we're talking about the number of distinct taxa, um, things like Shannon diversity, um, P. Lou's evenness, um, Faith's phylogenetic distinction, and then beta diversity is community structure. So looking at both um, presence, but now also relative abundances and phylogenetic relatedness. So we assume, we started out assuming that those measures would be the same for both species, that the bacterial group abundances, so when we identify the bacteria taxonomically, um, our hypothesis was that taxonomically the two gut microbiomes would be the same. And then again, based on their similar niches, their similar diets, um, our null was that the microbiome would function the same. So a little of the methodology here. Um, snails were collected in Michigan um, near the city of Lowell's wastewater treatment plant. And that'll um, come into play a little later uh, from the Flat River. Um, they were collected, brought into um, a, a rear, um, actually a freshwater mussel rearing facility for a couple days, and then frozen whole, and that's how I got them. Um, proof that I actually do occasionally do field work. Um, I'm, I'm far more known as a gel jockey and um, someone who is a liability in the field. Um, I'm old and fat. So, um, but proof that I can actually put on a pair of waders and go collect snails. So I did help. <clears throat> um, this isn't an anatomical diagram of a viviparid, but it's close enough. Um, we dissected out the intestine and a bit of the posterior stomach. Um, basically, you have to get the whole animal out of the shell, un, you know, kind of uncoil it, and then um, cut out the pieces you need. This was primarily intestine, rinsed in sterile water, and then um, we extracted the bacterial DNA using a bead beading kit. Um, so you just dump the um, tissue sample into the bead tube, strap it on a vortexer that grinds, um, mechanically breaks down the tissues as well as the bacterial cells. And then just a simple column extraction to get the DNA out and then um, sent it off to um, our favorite um, molecular biology lab for sequencing. Um, don't know how much of kind of 16S uh, microbiome or metagenomic experience people have, but a lot of the classic um, bacterial taxonomy work and metagenomics is based on the 16S ribosomal gene. Um, it, it is broken down into different variable regions um, based on the secondary structure of the molecule, shown here in E. coli. And one of the pieces that is commonly used is the V4 region. I don't know if you can, can you see my cursor? Okay. So this yellow piece up here is the V4 region. And it's one of two or three of these regions that are treated like bacterial barcodes. So the variation in these regions, V4 specifically, 
can be used to identify bacteria, occasionally down to species, but certainly um, phylum through family normally. So the lab amplifies this chunk of 16S, sequences it. Our lab used ion torrent. Um, nowadays, it would be an Illumina um, sequence. And they performed all of the QC. We are, we're a small school here, so, and we were a small school, smaller school in Texas um, where this work was started. So it was just easier to send everything off, but the lab does all the quality control. So basically takes the primer sequences out of your um, working sequences, remove, piece, uh, remove amplicons that are too short, ones with too many ambiguities, chimeras. So these pieces are sequenced in both directions and sometimes the software hooks the incorrect forward to the incorrect reverse sequence to form a chimera, those get taken out. Um, any multiple copies are taken out, bad quality bases at the ends are taken out, all that makes up the quality controlled. So what you're left with are amplified sequence variants. And what these are are unique sequences for this V4 region of the bacterial 16S. And that's what we treat as our individuals, if you will. Okay. Um, if you get into the bacterial literature, you may see the difference between an operational taxonomic unit, an OTU, and one of these amplified sequence variants. OTUs are clusters of ASVs, okay? And it's a fuzzy, in quotes, consensus of reads meant to account for sequencing errors. Okay. So what the algorithms attempt to do is to take all of your ASVs and at some level of confidence, combine them into these operational taxonomic units. The thought being that there's natural variation, and we want to, you know, put things that may be different, but close enough to get into one of these um, operational units. We kept it at the ASV level. Um, it's easier to detect sequencing errors, and it gives you a much finer scale taxonomic assignment uh, when you do that analysis. So when we're talking about alpha, um, diversity, we're talking about these different amplified sequence variants. Okay, so I'm going to present Shannon diversity numbers. It's based on how many different kinds of unique sequences there are, not these clusters. <coughs> All right, the first question we asked was Did we sample adequately? So for the ecologists in the room, this is just simple alpha rarefication. So species richness, if you will, in this case, ASV diversity as a function of ASV number. Um, if you sample appropriately, your rarefaction curve levels off. If it's still increasing, you haven't sampled enough. We didn't sample enough, but that wasn't um, surprising. Um, a lot of times when you're dealing with um, gut microbiomes, especially ones that haven't been well studied, um, you don't have any idea kind of where you're at. So probably around 60,000, if I remember correctly, um, is where we should have been. And we were at 30,000 because that's what we could afford. Um, we calculated four different diversity measures, again, um, three alpha, one beta. Um, Shannon diversity, again, for the ecologists in the room, you know that's quantitative richness. So we're counting ASVs, where another um, group might count species. Um, Faith's PD, which is a measure of qualitative richness, along with a phylogenetic measure. Okay, it's still alpha diversity. Um, P lose evenness, so quantitative evenness across different samples. And then for beta diversity, we did um, a multivariate analysis using what are called unifrac distances. 
and again, if you um, if you have learned about Bray Curtis dissimilarity in ecology before, or you're familiar with that, um, Unifrac is Bray Curtis plus phylogenetic relatedness. So it gives you community level structure, both based on presence, absence, relative abundance, and now this phylogenetic um, factor added in. Um, significance was measured at P less than 0.05 for everything. So between the two species, um, there were no significant differences in any alpha diversity measure. Okay. So both species showing the same kind of richness of microbial diversity. Um, this is a clustering diagram of those unifrac distances, um, just to kind of visualize it more easily. There was no significant difference in the beta diversity between the species. So similar diversity in terms of their gut microbiomes. Um, then we classified those ASVs taxonomically um, at the phylum family and genus levels. Um, we used a classifier that is um, a very conservative one, which is the 99% green genes database um, classifier. One of our species, um, heterogen, the Japanese mystery snail, um, had a number of unclassified ASVs. Um, so we took 50 um, ASVs from those kind of unclassified groups of ASVs, blasted them against the NCBI reference database, kind of get an idea of what they matched to. Okay, we're not trying to put an exact match to them. Um, and then um, significant differences here. Again, um, here it's a combination of both effect size and um, p-value. Um, so looking at those differences with a program called ALDEX, and for the stat for the stat people out there, this is an estimated p from a Welch's t test controlled for Benjamin e. Hockley, um false discovery rates. But the pretty pictures um, tell the story more easily. Um, there are there were phylum level differences between the two species, um, mostly in the number of um, factor IDDs and firmicutes in the two or between the two. Um, differences in family level classification and also differences at genus level. Okay, so we do have significant taxonomic differences um, between the two species. Now, you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, how do you get taxonomic, significant taxonomic differences when you're not seeing significant differences in especially beta diversity? Um, the reason is that the differences that are being picked up are among speed or among ASVs, okay, these taxonomic units that are very, very closely related. So the, um, the diversity measures aren't as sensitive to it as the taxonomic classification is. So there are reasons why you get significant differences at one level and not the other. Um, here are those differences. Um, just showing again at the family level or phylum family and genus level and what species the different groups were more abundant in. Um, you might say, okay, why is kingdom bacteria listed at the phylum level? And that's just, that's the level of confidence that the classifier gives you for that taxonomic group. Okay, so heterogen japonica had more bacteria that could not be identified to phylum than um, Campyloma decisum did. Okay, same with why is there a phylum under the genus level um, down here? It's the same thing. The, the classifier can't classify this group past phylum to 
appropriately put it into a genus level. Okay. So it's a little confusing that way. But it's it the point here is just to show which bacterial groups are being picked up as different. Okay. Um, I've listed some of them here with an effect size over 0.5. Um, usually they say an effect size over one. Um, absolute value of one is meaningful. But again, this is more exploratory, so there they are. Um, like I said, we did blast some of these um, abundant but unknown things. Um, so especially in heterogen, um, we saw a large number of these uncultured um, things that are likely mycoplasma species. Um, and in fact, their closest GenBank match uh, was mycoplasma from another freshwater snail, um, Biomphalaria. So that was one of the very, that was one of the two most abundant unknown groups. Um, the other one is probably a pseudomonad, um, and again, it's close. It's um, best phylogenetic match to GenBank was other uncultured things from the guts of land snails and earthworms. All right, last thing we did then was we also estimated microbiome function. Now, this is extremely difficult when you're using both the short V4 region that we're using as well as not well understood microbiomes. Um, so programs like the one we used, which is something called pie crust, which reconstructs the metagenome of the entire gut and compares it to the prokaryotic portion of the metapsych database. A lot of that is human derived. So you're trying to match environmental bacteria where a lot of them aren't well elucidated to a very small database of well elucidated human things. So don't read too much into this. Um, but it did highlight some interesting things that um, we think were important. And again, LDEX2, again, used to just determine our significant differences. There were significant differences in function. So no difference between the two species in diversity, differences in taxonomic composition, differences in microbiome function. The same free functional pathways were most abundant in both snails. Peptidoglycan synthesis, pyruvate fermentation, and aerobic respiration. Um, okay, that's what most, that's what a lot. Okay, so we're doing gram pos, a lot of gram positives that ferment pyruvate, um, which would suggest anaerobic respiration, but then a bunch of aerobic respiration too. So I think that's just more that the snails again live in and on the interface of the sediment in the water and just depending on where they are and what they were eating that day um, could influence that. Now there were 14 functional pathways that differed significantly between the species but all of them are in extremely low abundance so we're talking about below half of one percent mean abundance but there they are so we are getting some significant differences between, again, these very minor pathways. Excuse me. So what does it all mean? What did it all mean? So we tested three hypotheses. Um, the first, again, that we predicted that the alpha and beta diversity are the same for both species. And we supported that. There were no significant differences. So looking at the microbiomes, the gut microbiomes of the two species, if you count up the number of bacterial taxa, ASVs in our sense, um, and look at how they're related to one another, you're not seeing any significant differences between the two species. You are seeing taxonomic differences between the two species. So the makeup of the microbiomes are taxonomically different and the microbiome functions 
are significantly different. So what does all of that mean? What are we trying to do with it? So one of the first things we saw was that Firmicutes was the most abundant phylum in both species. This was surprising because proteobacteria, that phylum is usually the most abundant phylum in gut microbiomes of land snails, marine snails, freshwater snails, freshwater fish, marine fish, pretty much all gut microbiomes of things that live in water are dominated by proteobacteria. Ours were dominated by firmicutes. Now, it, that can be reflective of potentially sedimentary habitat. We know that zebra mussels, for example, if you sample the druses and the water around them, have a high degree of firmicutes in them. Um, so other sedimentary mollusks um, actually do have high firmicutes. It may also be reflective of detritivores and filter feeding habit. Filter feeders tend to have more firmicutes, detritivores tend to have more firmicutes. What we think is really going on is that as we learn more and more about mollusk gut microbiomes, that firmicutes may actually be the more significant group or that the proteobacteria numbers and the firmicutes numbers can vary seasonally, dietary, um, you know, in a dietary fashion, and that really the data in the literature is just undersampled. So, but that was interesting. <clears throat> Both snails had abundant, high abundances of bacillus and clostridium bacteria in them. Um, that would suggest a diet that's high in carbohydrates, um, especially structural carbohydrates like cellulose, lignin, chitin. Again, both species um, are detritivores. They will eat um, dead plant matter, dead animal matter. Um, they'll graze off of um, algae and fungus off of different submerged surfaces. So there's no doubt that they're probably getting a high amount of carbohydrate in their diet and their microbiomes reflect that. Um, the native species, Campylomatocytosum, had more anaerobic carbohydrate metabolizers, things like Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus, some Enterobacteriaceae. And again, these are um, tax, bacterial taxa that are known to anaerobically hydrolyze cellulose. So again, that dietary connection, um, fermentation through lactic acid fermentation, um, reduction of nitrates. Again, all these anaerobic um, metabolic processes were more abundant in um, the native species. And again, that could simply reflect um, dietary differences between the two species or microhabitat differences um, between them as well. Uh, the invasive species had more unclassified bacteria in its microbiome. Um, and again, of those unclassified things, uh, mycoplasma and sort of these generic proteobacteria came out as highly abundant. Uh, mycoplasma are common animal cell parasites. Um, if you've ever done cell culture in the lab, the one thing you fear most is a mycoplasma infection. They're extremely small um, and they can spread very, very easily. What was interesting was that the mycoplasma were not found in Campylona. And we know that there's plenty of, in the native thing. So we know there's plenty of mycoplasma out in the environment. Okay, we can sample it. Um, but it seems that the native species of snail may be less sensitive to infection from it. So it could be a coevolution thing, could be an immunity pathway but the native snails don't tend to get infected by mycoplasma. The invasive things are full of them. Okay. So the invasive species, again, may be sensitive to native pathogens. Um, the proteobacteria that we found as a, um, we're not surprised by, that's probably just some common environmental strain or taxon that um, is closely related to something out in the environment that we're not you know, just hasn't been described or elucidated yet. So that wasn't as interesting, but that mycoplasma stuff 
um, we're actually following up on. Um, again, microbiome functions may be tied to diet and habitat. Um, the belief among most freshwater, my, across most freshwater kind of gut skin microbiome studies are that the environment is seeding the microbiomes of the organisms. So it looks like the native and the invasive species are kind of being seeded by the same things, but then internal biochemical pathways are kind of selecting which ones um, maintain. So for example, the native one had significantly more abundant breakdown pathways, things like aromatics, other pollutants. Remember these were collected um, near a wastewater treatment plant. Um, these are often associated with pseudomonads, which were also more abundant in um, the native species. And again, it could be an adaptation to pollution thanks to its microbiome, that it can handle um, these pollutants better based on what bacteria it's harboring. The invasive species had higher methane oxidation and sialic acid metabol metabolism. Um, this implies it's ingesting more anaerobic particles. Um, decisum, the native species, does more um, scraping than it does filter feeding. The invasive thing filter feeds a lot. So it could be picking up more of these anaerobic uh, particles out of the environment and processing them. The sialic acid pathway actually makes sense because sialic acid is one of the mechanisms that allows mycoplasma to infect the cells. So the invasive thing has more infectious mycoplasma. You see an increase in um, that bacterial pathway. So it all kind of goes well together. All right, um, some big plans for small cells. Um, this was sort of my first, this project was sort of my first real foray into snails and bacteria. Um, I've got a lot of both collaborative projects going on as well as just with my students here. So at least for these two species, I'd love, or we're working to establish core gut microbiomes for each species. So sample them from um, across their ranges and see what microbes pop out consistently and kind of establish what that core might look like. Um, compare it across other native species and compare it across other invasive species, um, specifically within this family. So um, the Chinese mystery snail, um, the band, what's Georgiane? It's the banded mystery snail, I think. Okay. Um, it's a Southern um, US native that's been introduced up the um, East Coast. Uh, compare the microbiomes between sexual and asexual populations of Campyloma decisum. Um, mm -hmm. Campyloma decisum appears to have started out as a sexual species. It got pushed likely south through glaciation, and then asexual populations repopulated northward up into Canada as the glaciers receded. Now, we've seen in other freshwater snails that sexual and asexual populations can have different microbiomes. So there's some evidence to say that these should be different as well within the species. And then we know that different anatomical compartments can differ within a, spe you know, within a snail, within a species. So look at kind of the snail as a community of microbial communities that the biofilms growing on the shell would be a very different microbial community than what might be in the mouth, what might be in the stomach, what might be in the intestine. And one of the things that we've just um, submitted for publication is looking at the brood. So these are live bearing snails. The mothers have brood pouches that they raise their juveniles in. So a little sneak peek at uh, what my undergrad just finished. So again, this is um, beta diversity community structure, um, color coded by individual snails. So this is one mother, or these are two mothers, and their broods. One brood was 22 individuals, one was 24. So we sequenced um, the bacteria from all of them. 
And we see a very distinct difference between the, the bacterial diversity of the tissues of the mother's brood pouch versus what's going on with the juveniles. And the juveniles can be half a millimeter long. So we, we were just grinding up individual snails. And what's really interesting here is that the juveniles are basically monocultures of one pseudomonad. So mom's brood pouch environment is a lot more diverse, but what's actually going on with each individual juvenile is they're essentially these monocultures of the same pseudomonad. Um, and that could be interesting um, because we know pseudomonads can produce um, antibiotics. They can outcompete other bacterial taxa um, by restricting their growth. This could be something simple as the bacteria get in through the reproductive um, pore to the outside and kind of colonize inward and just outcompete things. There may also be an advantage here um, that this pseudomonad is beneficial because it's keeping potentially um, virulent or bad bacteria out of the mothers. So you heard it here first. All right, I'm pretty much on time. Um, so some acknowledgments. Um, I keep saying we. Um, um, the other we is um, an undergrad I had when I was in Texas, um, Ernest North. You can actually see the first version of his of this project's poster um, behind him. Um, he received um, an undergraduate research grant from the Texas Academy of Sciences, and that funded a lot of this research. You're frozen, um, Russ. I'm frozen. Can you hear me? Now you're frozen. Hello? Can anyone hear me? I can. Okay, I can see you. Okay, I can see people again. We're, We're back. back. I'm sorry. We're back. All right. Good. Well, good, because there's only like one slide left. So let's just, um, let me just fire this up. I just want to give people their, their due. All right, just quickly, um, again, Ernest was my undergraduate um, in, in Texas. He got funding from the Texas Academy of Sciences to do this, and then we finished up the project when I got up here to Gannon, and the snails were um, kindly collected and given to us by Dr. Dave Zanata out at Central Michigan. And that's it. Um, I will happily do my best to answer any questions that you might have. And maybe I can come back in a year or two and talk about some of the things that Dr. Hayes and I are working on with other texts. Uh, if, if you want to use the chat function, I'm actually pretty good at Zoom. So if you want to use the chat function for your questions or if you don't have any and you just want to go have lunch, I totally get that too. Okay. Thank you so much, Russ. Great, great seminar. Any questions for Dr. Minchin, folks? Uh, yes, it's Bill Stadden. I have one. Okay. Um, I've always been curious as to how you isolate the gut um, from whatever organism it is without contaminating it from, say, the water or from the shell in this case. Is it just as simple as isolating the gut and then um, uh, rinsing it in sterile water? That's what we do. Okay. So um, if they're frozen, it can be a little sketchy. As you, I don't know what I don't know what your background is, but I'm a microbiologist, but not a snail person. Okay, um, yes. So when you freeze a snail, it turns to mush. 
So, so frozen isn't always the best. Um, if we're doing microbe work, I'd much rather have alcohol because then um, you can do a much better job of keeping the tissues separate from one another while you're dissecting them out. Um, these are relatively big. Um, so that's one of the invasive ones. So, yeah. Um, they're relatively easy to dissect at this size. Um, and again, um, we do our best. We rinse with just, you know, with molecular grade water. We know that there's probably a little cross contamination, but it's also why you do 10 or 12 of these um, to kind of get, again, that population look um, versus just doing it individual. And there may be better ways. Um, you know, I'm not going to be like um, a colleague of Dr. Hayes and I, uh, who works on micro snails in Texas and where she's trying to dissect out you know, quarter millimeter, half millimeter things. No, no, don't. <laughs> okay, thanks. I, I would fat finger that too too easily and not worth doing. So, <laughs> Russ, I've got a question. Yes, um, maybe this goes beyond your work, but do you do? Is there any evidence or thought that maybe it's the micro invasive species often are very successful in novel habitats and often can go across wide, wide habitat ranges. Do you think differences in gut microbiomes might attribute, might, be, might, might, be, might help these invasive species better adapt to different habitats versus our native species? So that was kind of where we were thinking. That was kind of the thought was that, okay, if there is, because we know there can be maternal transfer um, between mothers and offspring, so maybe the invasive things are harboring and consistently harbor. They pass it on to their offspring, different microbes that allow them to utilize a suite of habitats. Mm -hmm. You know, again, these novel habitats in novel ways that the natives can't. From reading the literature, and we haven't tested it specifically. Right. I was out there, but we haven't tested it specifically, but we know that in fish, which have been very, very well studied and other groups, that you always get a site effect, that the habitat is always dry, the main driver of specifically gut microbiomes. So we went into it thinking they're harboring them. What is probably what we think is probably happening is that the invasives are either more receptive mm -hmm. or more able to utilize those available microbes to do what they need doing and that that may be their advantage. Okay. So, so it's less I'm bringing what I need with me versus when I get there, I can utilize what's there in a way that potentially a native, if you swapped them out, they wouldn't be able to. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any mechanism for that, but, mm -hmm. but in the literature, that certainly seems to be the pattern that, that repeats over and over and over again, that that everything's coming from the environment. Now it's just a matter of, okay, what's getting in, what they're using it for, so on and so forth. Interesting, okay. Thank you, Russ, thanks. I do have a question. Sure. Um, so it was a great talk. I liked your talk. Uh, I'm just wondering what is the general difference uh, between the gut of like uh, humans to versus snails, like in terms of pH, anaerobic environment, uh, in terms of anatomy. Okay, I missed the first part of your question. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 
Okay. I got the difference yeah. between humans and snails, but I'm not sure what. Right. I'm... In terms of like the anatomy, the pH, um, the anaerobic environment. Oh, okay. So, so how does that contribute to the general microbiome of the snails versus the general microbiome of humans? Okay, I'll be honest. I don't know the physiology mm -hmm. at that level, but um, it, it is a similar system in the fact that, right, single tube, mouth to a stomach, um, a, 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 a single large digestive gland mm -hmm. um, that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, this, these snails don't have a cecum, they don't have, or cecum, they don't have a very complex digestive tract. It's very much just an intestine where fecal pellets develop and then are just, um, you know, excreted from the animal. So I do know that they have measured it, um, again, in giant African land snails, um, that data is available where they have looked at, you know, they will do gastric lavage of the snail. They will um, kind of get those physiological parameters for each compartment. Now, how that compares to humans, uh, I legitimately don't know, but um, I'm going to assume at some level that there's enzymes in a more acidic environment in the stomach relative to a more neutral in a intestine, but Thank you got you. there. <laughs> I was wondering if you think um, some of the differences that you found um, could explain why um, Japonica is uh, found in a variety of different habitats where you know, you collect them at the same place, but, you know, Campoloma is pretty restricted to lodic environments and maybe a little in the backwaters, but, um, you know, Japonica, we have in Jacobson's Park in a, in a artificial lake up here in Lexington, um, but we're at places where you wouldn't find Campoloma at. So I was wondering if you think any of these differences, like, you know, you mentioned anaerobic, aerobic respiration, um, you know, do you think those type of things sort of contribute to the success just in terms of being able to get into different habitats? I I don't know. I think I'm sure it ties in um, because we were looking, you know, again, looking at the gut, you're dealing more with what's either being incidentally or intentionally ingested. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes, maybe they are more able to tolerate anaerobic environments kind of as a you know as a species level physiological difference and that boils you know and then that trickles down essentially to the gut yeah. and okay you're going to find more anaerobic things but the fact that the snail can be found in really good clear water and really lousy backwater you know again it's you know it's it's what's going on in the organism we think that's that's allowing that selection or allowing that um, utilization of bacteria as a resource gotcha. of anything else. Did that answer your question? That's yeah, yeah. Getting at? Okay. Yeah, it's sort of like the physiological constraints on the organism itself, and then the, the combination of the environment sort of dictating what bacteria might be in there. Exactly. So, you know, so walking, you know, a snail walks into a bar and there's, <laughs> you know, is introduced into a body of water and there, you know, it's physio, you know, it's physiology will, you know, is allowing it to be there, but then yes, what constraints, what pressures are on it that may limit or allow it to utilize different bacterial resources, um, or even just to ingest them and survive mm -hmm. that, you know, in a way that the natives can. Thank you, Russ. Any further questions for our speaker folks? Russ, well, thank you so much for coming. We yeah, really thank you for having me. So, And Russ, I think we'll take up an invitation that you mentioned a few moments earlier, uh, maybe later on, have you come back maybe next semester or sometime and talk about your current next collaboration year, with Dr. Year. Hazen. Next year. 
Next year, next year sounds good enough. Both of us so, are very, very busy. So. <laughs> Department chairs have their own little purgatory, I understand. Yes, yes. I No one else wanted to do it, and now I know why. So. <laughs> well, everyone, thank you for coming to our seminar. Russ, have a great week. Thank you.